All right, so acute principles, uh, blood, IV fluids, and shock. Um, we start to incorporate IV fluids towards the end because they're priority to shock and uh, revascularization of a patient that has an acute principle, especially with trauma and shock. But there's some things that we need to cover before we get there. And uh, more importantly, uh, we bring up the previous um, content that you've had uh, in Nursing 1, Nursing 2. All right, so NCLEX and the fluids. So we're going to do a recap of what we talked about earlier. Um, Flaps are important mainly based on mean arterial pressure and perfusion. And perfusion is one of the concepts that is, is necessary to understand because it's all based on normal hemodynamics. And when we talk about sepsis, IV fluids, and shot, it's all about normal hemodynamics. And previously we talked about, we laid it down in hemodynamics with CVPs, see the volume peripherally, which is based on volume. And we said that CVP and cardiac output and uh, PAWP. Well, these are all hemodynamics. We're going to cover those a little bit more in depth when we get into shock because based on what we're seeing here, we will then titrate medications to um, see what's going on because we're beyond blood pressure at this point once we start to have hemodynamics. Well, fluids is the boat coming, right? So, I mean, generally... Um, we see the boat um, based on these vital signs over here. And these vital signs are important to know, and we talked about that from the very beginning, where we say that you know low heart rate is bradycardia, and usually medications cause that, or they're an athlete, um, because generally the mechanism is never to go low. It's always to generally go higher, and that's because the brain is involved. And when the brain is involved, it's recognizing that cardiac output is low or volume is low. And in response to that, it's going to elevate this um, heart rate. And we said that normal heart rate is 60 to 100. However, you know, an NCLEX will always give you greater than 100. Um, we talk in our class about greater than 90 is a problem because we're always talking about the boat coming first. But when you get to the NCLEX, um, and they're talking about IV fluids, it goes back to the medication. The patient is getting fluids for a specific reason. And sometimes it's beyond the symptomology here. They're just going to give you that fluid. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. And we're going to start to pull in these labs a little bit more closely as we go to uh, shock. All right, so we said that Fluid status has to be known. And either they're going to be uvovolemic or hypovolemic. And if they're hypovolemic, heart rate will start to increase and the normal mechanism will start to play in. However, we also said that when somebody's peeing, puking, or pooping, they are losing fluid. And so fluid is always the reason for IV fluids. I know rocket science, right? So IV fluids equals fluids, right? And so we're trying to correct a fluid state of this patient, or we're trying to maintain their current fluid state. And that's the priority principle, because fluid loss on a patient is will start to go the minute they sit in bed. And we said that that, that is anywhere from 500 to 1,000 milliliters, right, which is basically is one liter, right, and that's one IV back. And that's important to know because a whole liter they'll lose just sitting in bed. That's insensible loss. Now, that's not even talking about a patient that has a high fever, you know, so they're going to might lose double that. Hence, that's why acute patients with fevers and different things have IV fluid running. But we also talked about how IV fluids in a question might not be about fluids, but maintenance of that fluids. And that's called isotonic solutions, where isoperfect. And when we're talking about fluid loss, we have, got to backtrack in a little bit, uh, sensible, sensible loss, then we have urine output. And urine output is you add these two together, then you have 1,500 to 25. And that's what a normal urinary output, we said 30 cc's an hour or 424 hours. Well, if all hemodynamics are fine, they have a normal blood pressure, then how do we really know? We said the systolic greater than 
100, um, and mean arterial pressure. Well, in mean arterial pressure, is calculating mean arterial pressure is important because it's all about perfusions. And perfusion, the first to get lost is the brain. And if that brain is not being perfused with the mean arterial pressure of 70, 75, you're going to have disorientation and restlessness. That's why seeing a patient who's restless in the bed is always acute. You see that patient first. Well, this is a good thing because mean arterial pressure and restlessness, I mean, the patient is aware that something's going on and they start to get more restless and start to get a little bit more um, acute. If this boat isn't seen, um, the mean arterial pressure will drop even further. Now, we also see this boat in the BUN and creatinine. See, and that BUN and creatinine is also telling us that if this BUN is elevated, we go down to the creatinine, is the kidneys still working? Well, if they're not, then that patient is dry, which means that the pulse should start to elevate, okay? And this is kind of the normal mechanisms. So we're talking about IV fluids, and why do we need to know them is, well, if NCLEX is presenting an IV fluid, it's acute because it's right now, it's going on right now. And it's saying, here's the boat, what are you gonna do with it? And can you even understand what we're talking about? And that's why IV fluids are imperative to know. And they're easy questions because, one, you have to know what they are, and then two, what the mechanism, what you're looking for. And as a blanket statement, generally, lung sounds is priority action on all IV fluids. All right, so, so we have the mean arterial pressure, we have the, uh, assessment and you know just a repeat of that mean arterial pressure so uh three uh, dds right diastolic plus diastolic plus systolic divided by three so three dentists will give you your mean arterial pressure but you should know that by now all right so now we move into the actual what kinds of iv fluids well we said that there's two generic statements that they'll say one is crystalloids and then the other one is colloids. Most likely to be tested on will be crystalloids, right? Because crystalloids are separated into three different parts, right? Isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. So three different types of crystalloids. And then colloids are just basically like sponges inside the, um, inside the vasculature. And those are taken specifically for each one. And generally, you know, the rule is gen, uh, that you assess volume status, you know, when you're giving a colloid. Remember, if you're giving a colloid, you are giving something that you don't want a lot of fluid shifts, or you're in control of that fluid shift, like albumin. Albumin is a colloid. You give it to pull fluid in. And we'll talk about that when we get to shock. All right, so crystalloids, three kinds. Why do we need to know? Well, first off is if we get the generic statement of crystalloids or colloids, it's just whether I know what they're talking about in that content. Then we move to the next, next thing, which is three types. Well, three types of IV fluids um, are isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. But it's more about the assessment. And we talked about the assessment process of ACOR, and I said, this is basically my assessment of how I look at medic, uh, IV fluids when I go into the room. The first one is assessment, right? So what in the assessment of the patient means that they get this IV fluid? Why, why are they getting this IV fluid? And we talked a little bit about the process of walking into the room and seeing an IV and then going through this assessment. The second thing we're gonna ask is compatible. Is it compatible with what we're giving? We saw that with lactated ringers, though it is an isotonic solution, it doesn't necessarily mean it's really compatible with a lot of things. We talked about farting flagel and all those type of things. So if you have an IV medication there, is it compatible with what you're given? Next thing is, um, why is it ordered? You know, why does this patient have this uh, med ordered? You know, why is it hypertonic versus hypotonic? Why is it isotonic? Why is it lactated ringers? It's just to keep on assessing this process. And then R, running. 
Why is it still running? And like I said before, is if the patient is sitting in the bed and um, eating and drinking, why do they need this IV fluid, right? And so there's a big principle for that. All right, so that's the basic assessment. And I talked about the different IV types and the different gauges and different things like that. Now, gauge is a little bit nuts to know. However, when we get to um, blood today, um, that's important because you want anywhere from an 18 to 20 gauge uh, IV, you know, uh, for that blood to be giving it. Just think about it. If you, you have, you know, blood and you have formed elements, right? and that's important to know. And um, you don't want them going through like a blue, which is a 22, right, which is too small. You have more likelihood of hemolysis, you know, of those blood, and you just have to get fragments in them, more likely to have an um, infiltration of that. So 18 to 20 is the ideal for blood, um, and that's the only time you really see gauges. In practice, you see it all the time. However, in NCLEX questions, um, that's the only time you'll see those gauges. All right, so let's talk about um, the first one, isotonic. So we said there's three different types, isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. So the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, land high five, right? So first one is these are isotonic solutions, right? So isotonic, um, you know, isoperfect, right? So perfect uh, solutions for generally stable, easily corrected, predictable patients, right? So they tend to be, they don't really cause fluid shifts. They, 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 are, they keep them hemodynamic. So when you have a post-op patient, you know, they shouldn't be bleeding because they're post-op, right? So if you have a patient who's dehydrated, well, the mean arterial pressure might be less than 70, but the kidneys aren't affected yet, okay? So they're still kind of perfect. You just need to give them some fluids and different things like that. It's the same thing where a patient who is orthostatic, and we talked about that before, if it's not med-related, it's fluid-related, and they don't have enough fluid, they can't vascularize, so they get dizzy. And when they get dizzy, so then we would most likely give them normal saline. So the first isotonic solutions is land high five. And we said that priority is normal saline first. So normal saline, right? Same like patients, right? So it's most likely same like the patient's normal osmolarity in their blood. Uh, so this tends to be the, the standard, right? So normal standard patients. Um, so we, we always see that. Next is um, our lactated ringers. We said lactated ringers is generally two. And we said that lactated ringers is, um, is more acute than normal saline. Because you don't expect it. You know, if you have it, it's very specific. And then we said D5, right? Um, high five, right? So high sodium, uh, hyponatremic. And we said that this is very interesting because it is um, high, uh, hypertonic because the D5 Five, and then it is um, isotonic in the body. No, reverse that, right? Hypotonic, I forgot. All right, so, and then assess. Okay, so the next thing is that when we break it down, All right, so uh, LR. So normal saline, we said is normal, and then we said LR. So we said patients with liver and renal, and we said that liver would be AST, ALT, and then we said renal would be uh, BUN and creatinine, but generally not BUN, right? Because BUN would be dry, okay? Um, creatinine, right? That means the kidney's still working, but if both of them are elevated, that's when we start to think about this, and then we're going to look at the GFR. However, a person with a chronic kidney disease, you know, they have a GFR of 50 or even 40 or 30, they're still losing their potassium, 
right? So, I mean, they're not really an acute patient. You know, if the GFR is less than 15, then I'd worry about lactated rings with this patient. Now, NCLEX will never test you on that, but it's just good to know. Um, the next thing is that um, LR, lactated ringers, you know, you never leave running, right? So um, it's generally something that is up, then down, okay? And you're always looking, it's four reasons of bump, right? So burn patients, urgent trauma, maternity patients, and then uh, post-op patients. And we say that this is all because of muscle injury, stress, and acidosis. These are all reasons why uh, somebody needs some sort of buffer, which lactated ringers generally is. Now, if you're looking at somebody like a septic patient who's very acidotic, a lot of times, sometimes doctors, depends on the doctor, right, MD, my decision, will choose lactated ringers over normal saline because of this concept. Because if they have DIC or they have mass inflammation, right, and all the vessels are all kind of broken down and they're all becoming acidotic, sometimes they'll use lactated ringers over normal saline. But it's not always 100% that way. All right, so some other things that we're gonna look at, and why don't we leave it running? It's called the CLAPS and um, C-L-A-P-S. And it's because they have chloride in it. They have lactate in it. Um, you're, you're assessing this patient for liver and uh, renal and all that stuff. And then uh, potassium and then sodium. And we said that, okay, well, that's interesting. That's, that's good to know that. Um, and you can see why it's incompatible with other medications because of, because of this process. You have all this kind of isotonic with electrolytes and everything like that that is really causing this problem. And we said that, well, how do I know how much um, electrolytes are in there and this or anything? And this is nuts to know. You don't need to know this. Um, but it's kind of fascinating because it's, you, already, you do already know this. And we talked about this when we talked about the BMP. And we said that BMP is generally, you know, peeing, pooping, or puking, right, or the quadruple Ds, right, drains, diuretics, uh, diarrhea, I forget the D, last name, and um, all things related to fluid. So if these things are going on, you're going to have fluid and electrolyte problems. So um, chloride is generally, we start with that, that's 95 to 105, and so the amount of chloride in lactated ringers is about 105. Um, lactate, I said that is um, 22 to 26 or 28, and it's around this range right here. And we said potassium, isoperfect, isotonic, uh, 3 to 5, and we said it's perfect in the middle. So it's about four milli equivalents of potassium. Out of all these things, this is the most acute, right? I mean, potassium, because like usually, you know, we're worried about that. It makes sense if a patient is having some injury and different things like that. Potassium spills out as far as when you talk about Burns patients. Now, Burns patients, you have, you know, K to the cell, right? majority of the potassium it's inside the cell kin to the cell so when these start to break all this potassium goes out into the ecf and so you'll have an elevation of potassium when a burn patient has it so then you say well why do we give it to a person when a person is burns right well they're not in renal failure right so they're still peeing so the, the body's able to handle it. So they take the potassium in and then diuresis and diuresis and diuresis and diuresis and diuresis. We're not talking a renal patient, We're talking about burn patient. And then we said um, maternity and potassium, same sort of things, stress on the, the body, also injury and those type of things. Um, so that's potassium and then sodium, right? So sodium is normally 135 to 145, and the sodium concentration of this solution is about 135, 134, 32. All right, um, nuts to know. You don't need to know that. It's just one of those things that's kind of neat to know um, when we're talking about 
NCLEX and IV fluids. All right, um, what else we have? So then we moved into uh, uh, D5, right? So we said land, right? D5, um, high five. So hyponatremic, right? And then we said that um, they become hypotonic. It's hypotonic in the body. Uh, so, um, no, hypotonic in the, in the bag, isotonic in the body. And that's why it's categorized as an isotonic solution. That's a trick question on comprehension and like Saunders questions and stuff like that. You'll, if you're doing a lot of questions on IV fluids and stuff, you'll see this D5 question. And a lot of times it's with uh, ICP. And it's with um, this concept of how it changes when it's in the body. All right, uh, what else we have? We have, um, then we go into actual hypotonic uh, solutions. And so hypotonic, so we said there's a big hippo. And, and, Kind of looks like a pig, whatever. I don't even know what to do. They're, they're floppy, is where the kind of looks like who knows. All right, so hypotonic, right? So zero, 45 ton hippo. Okay, 0 0.45. And we said that's you know sodium, normal saline, or NaCl. They say and um, 45 ton hippos. Uh, so what happens to this? Well, I mean. All the fluid that was outside ECF, right, hippo, right, goes into the cells. So the cells burst. This is an important concept here, right, because patients who get hypotonic solutions tend to infiltrate in there. They tend to be high infiltrations. And the reason is, is when you infuse this into this vasculature, Right, and it starts to go up, you have this fluid shift into these cells that a lot of times burst and they call it, cause it phlebitis. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's tied to the dextrose and different things like that. So normal saline doesn't tend to uh, infiltrate as much where um, your isotonics, no, your hypertonics and hypotonics tend to infiltrate. All right. Um, Let's go on. So then we have, then we have hypertonic, right? So um, let me move a little bit forward here. So hypertonic. So um, hypertonic is hyper, right? So hyper. So I think fast. If you're fast, you sweat. If you sweat, you lose volume. Okay. So it leaves this cell, and then it comes out. So water comes out. So patients with hypertonic, they're going to suddenly flood into their vasculature. And so all this water is going to fill up into this vasculature. Well, that causes problems because of lungs. And that's why lung assessment is priority. They have a risk, a huge risk with CHF patients and fluid overload. So you tread very lightly with these um, hypertonics. So how do I know it's hypertonics is is this D5, right? So D5 sugar water, D5. And um, you're introducing all the sugar into this water, and into this vasculature. So you have all the sugar, and that's problematic, right? Because sugar loves water, right? So it pulls water into the vasculature, and then you have fluid overload. But as we've learned before with mannitol, you know, sugar's great for the brain. And that's why we have use for a head injury, because the brain, you know, likes sugar. Because it's more osmotically for the brain. We said it's not the front line. So um, most likely on NCLEX and different things like that, you tend to have, tend to have you know, this with this, and um, not so much this, but more most likely on the fluid overload. So, like I said, you know, fluids are pretty, um, they're not that complex, like when you really think about it. It's just understanding the basic principle about it. And then you can kind of go through 
you know, why you would do something and different things like that. Because it kind of makes um, sense right here. A little typo that goof. Well, that's good. Great. Add it to the list. All right. Um, hypotonic, you know, for CHF patients, big problem. Brain injury is a good problem. And um, then we just basically monitor. So that's the main concepts with these fluids. Um, and always for practice, though, you have assessment, um, compatibility order, and then running. And then we talked about colloids. Now, colloids collect in the vasculature. Right? And they tend to just, I always think of them as a, like a sponge, you know. They just kind of keep the vasculature in, um, in control. And we don't want to be moving fluids around too much and different things like that. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, we can cause some problems with it with, with fluid overload, right? Because it is like a sponge, right? So, so um, if the patient isn't ready to be diuresed, for example, if this patient has an elevation of a BU and a creatinine, and that creatinine is less than 60, and there's no urinary output, and I give a colloid, well, colloids love water. They're like sponges. And so I think when we talked about like albumin, so if I give albumin, it's going to pull all this ECF fluid into this vascular space. Well, the problem is lungs again. Okay, so they can get fluid overload, especially if their renal is, is they're in acute renal failure. Where's, where's the fluid going to go? So it goes to the lungs. So that's a delicate balance. So we generally don't give albumin if they're in acute renal failure. I know more rocket science, right? So we, we would have a Foley in that person. And then, you know, we would then, you know, if we saw them in the diuresis stage, right, we said that renal goes into four phases, right? So onset, which is the actual problem. This is important for sepsis. Sepsis could put them in acute renal failure. Then the oligaric, right, which this patient would be. So I'm not going to give albumin. Right? But I wouldn't worry too much about like Hespan or head of starch because it's more like a sponge, but it doesn't cause as much fluid shifts. It still does, but not as much as albumin. All right, so then when, but if I start to see this person send a diuresis, I'm like, all right, let's give him some albumin. And then let's start to pull this fluid back into the vascular space. All right, so. Um, that's a colloid. And then we said that fresh frozen plasma, platelets, and stuff like that are not gen cryoprecipitate are generally not tested on. It's just, I mean, if they get tested on IV fluids, it's going to be crystalloids, colloids, and then uh, hypotonic, isotonic, hypotonic. Like I said, you know, there's 75, well, 60 questions now. You need 65% correct of that. 60 questions. I mean, if they're going to give you an IV fluid question, it's going to be about normal saline. D5 or something like that. All right. Um, 